everyone for joining um, into the Korean Pepper Wellness Webinar. Uh, it's a monthly podcast series where we share uh, plant-powered wellness tips for our furry kids. Um, so I'm Hetal Sheth, your host for tonight, founder of Korean Pepper and an animal advocate uh, raising plant-based dogs for the past 12 years. So uh, we have a very special guest tonight, and I'm really excited to be hosting her. Um, she's also popularly known as the vegan vet and has worked as a GP vet for over 30 years. She grew increasingly concerned with the obesity pe epidemic facing our pets. And after completing every nutrition course possible, she entered the fascinating world of sustainable pet foods and is now a very passionate advocate of a kinder, healthier way of feeding our dogs that benefit not only our planet, but our farmed animals too. So with that, I'd like to really introduce and welcome our host, uh, our guest for uh, this evening and afternoon in the UK, uh, Dr. Ariel Griffiths. Hello, hello, Dr. Ariel. Hello, Hazel. Thank you so much for that introduction. And so lovely to see some familiar faces watching. Just a warm welcome. We've got Joe from Hound and we've got the lovely Kathy who has um, April and June up in Scotland. And lovely to see new faces as well from across the ocean, <laughs> from, <laughs> which is wonderful to see. So thank you for inviting me. So uh, we also have uh, Shekhar online, um, who is also uh, responsible for managing social media at People Farm, which is an animal sanctuary uh, in India up north. And he's been vegan for the past two years and is um, actively devoted to the cause of animal right movements and is, al is always up for doing anything, any way that he can help um, you know, kind of make the world a kinder place for our animals and people. And he's kind enough to be volunteering here for us tonight uh, to help manage uh, the question uh, Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So um, for everybody who's online on Zoom, uh, I'd suggest that we uh, mute our lines. And if you have any questions, you can post them on the uh, chat window. And for all those who are going to be uh, joining us live on Facebook and Instagram, uh, you can uh, post your uh, questions in the comments section. We will uh, address questions from Zoom first and then uh, we will uh, follow up with questions on uh, Instagram and Facebook. So with that, I think we can get started. So thank you, Dr. Ariel, for joining us uh, here tonight. And I'm really excited to kind of be do having this discussion with you because I think I want people to hear like a veterinarian's perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, can you share a little bit about like what made you shift, you know, to plant power and um what have you seen making the shift you know like um yeah, based on your experience yeah well I mean I never dreamt at, at the age that, that I am that I could have such a life change um it was in my early 50s that um that I really made the change and it all came down to me just wanting to do the right thing by the health of our pets and um I was working as a vet at one of the charities in the UK. It's called the PDSA. And in one day, I had four animals to put to sleep for obesity-related reasons. Um, the enormous, there was an enormous Labrador. She came and she just flopped on the floor of my consulting room. Her arthritis was so bad, she, but she was so overweight that she had to be put to sleep. And then there was a cat that had cancer that was so obese, had to be put to sleep for. And I got home and, and there were four animals like that. And I was just emotionally drained. And I got home and I said to my family, that's it. I'm going to do something about this obesity epidemic because it's not right. Um, people love their animals so much, but they're feeding them the wrong things. And it's impacting in their lives considerably because the pain that they then go through, having caused these conditions by overfeeding their animal or feeding them the wrong things. And um, and so I, I, I said to my family, right, I'm going to start swimming pet classes. And, um, and I threw myself into this, but then I thought, actually, if I'm going to be running a slimming pet class, I really know nothing about nutrition because as vets and doctors are very much the same, my daughter is at medical school at the moment, and even now she's learned nothing about nutrition. You just learn about how to treat diseases. You learn about all the drugs in your third year of veterinary 
there's an entire year dedicated to pharmacology, which is the drugs that are used to treat these conditions. And especially with veterinary, you're just left, you leave it up to the big pet food producers. They infiltrate, and at the moment they do very much so in the veterinary schools, is they infiltrate the veterinary schools. The veterinary schools now have these enormous, it's vet, going to, to vet school now is very different to when I was there, but um, they have these enormous screens in the student canteens that show advertisements. And they constantly are showing advertisements about the the, the, <laughs> the very large pet producers, <laughs> pet food companies. So, so when you walk out of vet school, it's just a given that if the dog has a has a problem with nutrition, you just pick up the bags that are in the in the consultation and in the the waiting room, and and that's it, and that'll sort out the problem of the dog. And um, so I did every nutrition course going, and and the more I did, the more I realized that the more plants you added, the healthier the dog will be, and it would help the dog to lose weight. But um, but I also went through quite a, a phase, a life changing phase, I think, in myself. I began picking up rubbish around our house and um, on the streets. And I, I had this almost like a calling from nature. I could he almost hear the hedgehogs thanking me and the birds thanking me for trying to clean up their environment. And my son was vegan and I'd always admired him. He's a pharmacist. And I always thought, gosh, I could never go vegan. I love my my the foods that that I was so used to eating. I, my mother is French. I grew up in South Africa. So the combination of all those cheeses and the meats that you get with those two cultures, my, my life had not been anything vegan at all. And, um, and from one day to the next, I went vegan. Wow. I, it, all, it all fell into place. My, my inspiration of my son, the, uh, this, this feeling that I've got to do something to protect our natural environment plus the health of our pets and um but I did it not for my my health I did it for to find the perfect diet for our little family dog Ruff my husband is also a vet um he couldn't believe I was going to turn our little dog vegan because neither of us knew anything about it at all and so I had so much to prove because Ruff is actually the most important little person in our family. Our children have come and gone and gone to universities and left home and come. And Ruff is the little mainstay that binds us all together. We we almost talk to each other through Ruff <laughs> when, when <laughs> we're together. And um and that's where my journey began and a journey that I never dreamt would take me here, talking to you with everything I've learned. But when I throw myself into something I get a bit of I think a lot of us are like this we get a bit obsessive and with what I've discovered and found over the the years now of having done it and learned gosh I wish I'd made this change years and years and years ago I wish our previous Labrador that we owned who who never tasted anything plant-based in her life I wish she had been plant-based we adored her as well so so but I'm I'm not going to live with those regrets. I'm just going to live for the for, for the future and try to to tell people how amazing this is, and particularly vets. This is now my main my main aim is to actually show vets the the changes because the changes I've seen have been astounding. Which which I know you're going to <laughs> you're going to discuss this afternoon. Yeah. No, it's amazing to hear like a vet's perspective, right? Like because yeah, there are uh, nutritionists who speak about this now. Uh, but, you know, coming this from a vet's perspective is a whole different view because you've lived and dealt and treated animals with so many different disease. And now when you kind of implement a new lifestyle change for them and see the changes, I think that says a lot like when it comes from you guys. So um, you mentioned obesity, right? So I think I see a lot of dogs here who are overweight as well. And uh, can you uh, share your experience uh, about, you know, like um, how plant-based diets make that shift or help them lose weight and why it kind of works? Because I al I've also seen like every time they've uh, switched over from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, their body, they're in good body shape, you know? So can you explain a little bit from a veterinarian's perspective? Yep, it's um, it actually all boils down to the one most basic thing, which is the gut microbiome. Um, so the amount of studies that have gone on in the human space since COVID on the gut microbiome, and they mirror 
the, the dog's gut microbiome. So I've actually taken so many studies that have been done at the University of Oxford, very recently by a, a Professor Tim Spector here in the human space, but it's actually been shown that if you were given antibiotics as a child, if you had um, ear problems and, and you were given antibiotics as a child, and I see this in puppies who are given antibiotics, you will have a problem with obesity later on in your life and you're more prone to getting diabetes because of the destruction of, of the good gut bacteria. And I see so much of this with, with puppies as well, um, with dogs that have had long-term antibiotics. It affects the gut microbiome and it makes them a lot more prone to obesity. I mean, obviously a meat-based diet as well is so much higher in the saturated fats the animal fats. And, um, and in fact, over the years, meat has changed in its formation. So the feedlot meat that is being made now, these poor animals that are being overfed in the feedlot, they, what, what butchers, <laughs> I hate talking about this, but it's, it's so relevant, is they're actually, they're aiming for better marbling of the meat. So they want meat to have even more fat in it. So it looks it looks more appetizing to people. And so what you've ended up with is, is animals that are being grown, but have so much more fat in them. Um, and this is only in the last 10, 15 years as well. So obviously it's affected the human population, but these products are then being fed to dogs. Now, when you consider people feeding their dogs a very high meat-based diet, thinking they're doing the right thing, they do, they do not discern between the meat-based, whether it's a, a raw meat-based food that they're choosing or, 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 a, or a kibble diet, they don't consider that that's going to be different to the sausages that they're eating or the little bit of bacon that they're eating. But these are all so damaging to dogs because of the size of a dog <laughs> um and they will they'll they'll give this processed meat which is extremely harmful which causes high levels of diabetes it's going to cause high levels of pancreatitis we're seeing in dogs that are fed this high fat meat-based diet so as soon as you've got this extra fat obviously and, and a dog needs just a tiny bit extra to put that weight on when you consider small dogs then we've got the problem with overtreating is the humanization and there's, there's a known concept, it's called an oxytocin loop, where if you look at your dog, the dog will look at you because they want their treats. Um, and that stare results in you getting an oxytocin release by giving the dog the treat, which in turn releases the oxytocin and in, in the dog, which is the happy hormone. So people are actually getting this, this release of pleasure from feeding their dog, something they adore, they love, that they share everything with. They're in the home and they're their companion um, the charity that I worked at for some people, they said they wouldn't actually be alive if it wasn't for their pet having to get up every day in the company of their pet. So that's the importance that we put on pets in the home. And with that enormous importance of of the value of, of looking after somebody's mental health, which is what it is, is exactly what what our, our dogs are doing. And, and it happens the same with cats. It even happens the same with rabbits as well is you getting this this serious overfeeding far too many calories far too many treats um so a plant based diet means that you that you you first of all have to look at the label of everything you're giving your dog um which immediately turns you into a little bit of a nutritionist which is fantastic because what it does is it makes you look on the side of a treat packet and see oh has it got any meat based or any dairy or any milk in it no it doesn't but you also get to see how much sugar is in there and you also get to see all these these gums and these artificial additives and you think oh actually no i'd rather not have that and and the same goes with with a sausage. You'll you'll have a look and you'll you'll see. Okay, this is <laughs> this is going to be a plant based sausage, but actually yes, it's still quite high in salt. So so you constantly look at the ingredients, 
And as soon as you have that, that awareness of, of what you're giving, you then can give a much healthier diet. But dogs that are carrying that extra weight, and I know you would have seen it, Hatel, as soon as they go on to that extra good fiber that feeds that good gut bacteria, the weight just drops off. You can actually see it. And not just the weight dropping off, but what what the the, the people who, who feed their dogs this, this diet is they the dogs, they and the first thing they say is their dogs suddenly have so much more energy. So they can actually get up and they can go for longer walks. They can do that extra sniffing. They can get their dopamine release, which is what dogs love to do. And, and then that has a feedback loop because that then makes them feel so much better. So that extra weight just almost depresses our dogs completely. Sorry, that was a very long answer about weight loss. <laughs> I think that's really important. Two thing, two great points that you made was um, one about the oxytocin loop and feeding way too many treats. I think a lot of dogs here, especially here in India, are like way too overfed because the culture here around revolves around food, you know? So, uh, mm -hmm. so our pets are part of it as well. So we see that happening a lot. And the second great point that you kind of brought about and which I've also consistently seen is when you shift uh, dogs to a, from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, there is a reduction in weight that I have almost always seen. You know, I feel I, the dogs come more quicker to their ideal weight. And sometimes people panic, you know, like, oh, my dog's losing weight on plant-based diet, you know? And I, I just try to tell them they're like correcting their body uh, score naturally, you know, they're coming down to their right weight. So maybe uh, if we can touch a little bit about the body score conditioning so that, you know, it helps people understand that better when they're kind of transitioning, when they see that change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the body score is so important in your dog because obviously all our dogs have completely different body shapes, and there isn't really an ideal weight for for well, there should be an ideal weight for each breed. But even in each breed, you get so many different sizes of dogs. So it's really going to go according to the body shape of the dog. So the important one is to make sure that that your dog has a visible stomach line so you can actually see a bit of a bit of stomach um the extra hanging bit underneath is the dangerous fat and if you've got fat over their hips that's also just dangerous fat because if you've got fat there then you're definitely going to have this extremely dangerous visceral fat we call it which is the fat internally that's around the important organs it's around the kidneys it's around the pancreas it's around the heart but if you don't have the fat that's visible on the outside, you won't have that visible fat on the inside. Um, so, so a good way to, to measure the, the body score of your dog is with a piece of string is to actually measure their, their waist. So just behind their ribs and, um, and just keep the, the measurements of the string. You can hang it on your fridge and, and see, but also the, the measurement around their neck as well is so important, especially in our, in our flat nose breeds, our brachycephalics, because they carry a lot of their fat just under their chins. And that's dangerous for them too, because that results in even more breathing difficulties. They've already got a very short and nasal passage, but to have that extra fat around their, their respiratory region is far more dangerous. Plus all the, the extra fat puts, puts that extra load on the heart. So, so our little dogs that can suffer with heart conditions, the older, smaller dogs, so important to keep the weight off. But it's it's feeling, you mustn't be able to feel the indentations of the ribs, but you should be able to feel the ribs. And um, and you should, as I say, be able to to feel a, a stomach. So so there should be a nice curve where where their spine is and you shouldn't have fat um, over their hips as well that that you shouldn't have but using a string to actually measure the changes is a wonderful way of seeing those those changes um, some some dog is very difficult to weigh them so actually just measuring is is a better way to actually monitor the weight loss 
Yeah, that's a great tip, uh, Dr. Ariel. That's, I think that's really helpful and anybody at home can do it. Um, so uh, while you mentioned about the weight loss, you kind of briefly spoke about uh, the gut microbiome. And uh, can you talk a little bit more about the gut microbiome and how it affects um, dogs with allergies, you know, like having um, skin um, allergies, like atopic dermatitis and things like that. Um, how does that affect, you know, like itchy dogs, seasonal changes? Yeah, so, so we've got so many breeds that do suffer with sensitivities and a lot of, and especially the itchy skin, those will be the white coat dogs. Um, the highly bred dogs. Um, dogs, as I say, with the white coat tend to have a pink skin. Um, dogs that have had problems in the past when they were puppies, when they've been on antibiotics or they had a, a very bad bacterial infection or a blockage, um, and it all affected their gut microbiome, they tend to suffer with these immunity problems, late, these intolerances, we should say, later on in life. So Intolerances to certain foods is a very small percentage of the intolerances that we see or the allergies that we see. Dogs are primarily in, allergic to environmental allergens. And the main one that's right up there is house dust mites, um, which is, a, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to detract here very slightly from plant-based diets, but I'm just going to say there's an enormous surge in insect-based diets diets in the UK and actually they've found that dogs that have these these dust mite allergies actually they react because it's the chitin is the same DNA <laughs> that's found in house dust mice as is found in insect based diets so actually these dogs are reacting to to house dust mites so um, to insect based foods so actually plant based foods you can eliminate every single allergen that a dog may be intolerant to and and right at the top of the list of dogs having intolerances is actually beef Beef is not a natural food at all for a dog. They would never naturally yeah. go and, and catch a cow. <laughs> yeah. a cow. It's, not, it's not a natural food. Yeah. But certainly up there, obviously dairy comes a very close second because um, dairy has the same DNA. Plus dogs, no other mammals should be eating the, the food from another mammal, which is not, it's for baby cows, it's not for, for adult mammals, the, anything to do with, with milk, whether it's dairy, cheese, butter, um, none of those, our dogs, most of our dogs are going to be lactose intolerant. Um, so, so definitely those are the ones, but we've also got chicken right up there, which is, which is surprises so many people. There are so many dogs with intolerances to chicken. There are so many dogs with intolerances to wheat. The, the wheat gluten causes the problems. And then we have fish, we have rabbit, we have pork, and we have soya that are all in there. Now, soya is a fantastic protein source, but a lot of dogs do react to it. So you have to be mindful. And I know I'm quite sure you are, Hetal, with, with formulating your recipes is tofu is a fantastic um, source. I might add dog adores tofu. He and I basically live off tofu, but, um, but a lot of dogs have this intolerance to soya. But the wonderful thing with the plant-based diet is with dogs with intolerances, you can, and in fact, a minute before having this, this um, I, I keep getting emails from people. And this one was a lady who emailed me a minute before I, before I joined to you, Hazel. I was a lady with a giant schnauzer in the UK who um, he's six and is intolerant to everything. And he's on a, a, a hypoallergenic royal cannon diet. And she says he's still just having so many problems. So I will be emailing her after this talk because <laughs> plant-based diets, honestly, they just amaze me with how they sort out these intolerances um, naturally and purely. And it's all down to the gut microbiome because what you've got is, I mean, I could, uh, Kathy knows this, I could talk about the gut microbiome forever. I just love the gut microbiome. It's the most fascinating thing <laughs> ever. But what you've got, I'll just explain it in very short terms. 
is you've got these really, really good little gut bacteria that are like any other species in the world is they want to multiply, they want to thrive, they want to eat and they, they want the right foods. And the right foods for these good gut bacteria to thrive is going to be fiber, mammalian um, enzymes cannot digest, cellulose cannot digest fiber, but these good gut bacteria are desperate for it. They want to, they want this. This is their food and this is the prebiotic fiber. The good gut bacteria are called the probiotics. And once they eat this fiber and they, they eat it by actually cleaving it, by breaking it open, and they'll break open this fiber and release these amazing polyphenols, these antioxidants that are so important for the health of our dog. And their food that they produce, their, um, their production that they make, these good gut bacteria are called short chain fatty acids. And what these short chain fatty acids do is they actually give this perfect lining to the, if you, if the villus, you know, the little villi that that sit and absorb all the good nutrients. They give this most wonderful biofilm to the, the gut microbiome, uh, to the, the gut lining, and it's the right pH. And so this wonderful biofilm that these good gut bacteria have made with their produce, these short chain fatty acids, this stops the toxins from going in, all the nasties, but it allows the absorption of the important things. We've got the vitamin E, we've got the selenium, you've got the, the right amino acids that are needed for, for skin health, for fur health, for, for the growth of fur. Fur requires an enormous amount of protein and, and they're allowing the right proteins in and the right nutrients to really make our skin beautiful, but certainly the skin and the fur of our dog beautiful. And so that's why dogs with these severe intolerances, the, the very first thing you do is you can exclude those, those nasties, the beef, the chicken, the dairy, the wheat, the soya, you can exclude those completely in a plant-based diet. But then by giving that natural fiber and that healthy fiber and feed the gut microbiome properly, you then result in the, the proper absorption of the right nutrients, which... Um, which just does remarkable things to the health of the dog. So the other produce that these good gut bacteria make is serotonin. And serotonin results in lovely peristalsis of the gut for the digestion. But we all know that serotonin is also a, a calming hormone um, and explains the, the gut um, brain axis as well. And I've seen dogs with severe skin problems, um, an enormous Great Dane, for example, a rescue Great Dane who had two or three homes, who was meat-based before and he was rescued and, um, and his owner put him onto a 100% cooked plant-based diet. She was amazing. She bought a 20 kilogram pot to cook for him because he's obviously such a big dog, but he was so terrified of anybody coming to the door. And he's an enormous dog, 60 kilograms of great thing. And he used to hide behind the sofa when anyone came to the door. And um, and she transitioned him onto, onto plant-based and or homemade plant-based. And within a few weeks, she she contacted me to say that the changes were phenomenal. He no longer had these itchy ears, his fur went all soft, he wasn't biting and chewing his paws, he didn't have to go to the vet to have his anal gland squeezed. But she said the most remarkable thing of all is that people would ring on the doorbell and he would go to the door wagging his tail. So what you had there is a behavioral change. He wasn't sore anymore, but equally his body was then flooded with the right level of hormones, the serotonin and the tryptophan, which is a precursor, which which um, which is very high in, in the supplements that, that are needed when they're on a homemade plant-based diet. So yes, the, the changes can be just remarkable, um, but all it is is feeding the gut microbiome. I think I just put everything down to the success of, of looking after our gut microbiome. We're only alive because our bacteria let us live. I love that saying. <laughs> microcosm of microcosm, microorganisms, right? Like they say 80% of the health lies in the gut. 
Yeah, absolutely. Seven, well, seventy percent of our immunity is governed by by those gut microbiomes because they're the ones stopping those nasties from going in and stopping the toxins, stopping the free radicals from actually going through the cells, so going through into um, into the body of our dogs. And and interestingly, our dogs share a very very similar gut microbiome to us. They've actually shown that. In different areas of the UK where the water is different, the soil is different, people will have different gut microbiomes. But in a family, you'll have very similar ones. And so will the family dog. I know you mentioned about the water in India, Hetal, being different to the US. Um, and certainly all of that affects the gut microbiome. So it's a fascinating topic. <laughs> I could go on forever about it. The way you explain that, you know, because I think this is so important. Um, like when we adopted Brownie, he had severe al uh, allergies. He he was not a planned adoption. Like he chose to move in with us. He was my neighbor's dog um, and he loved the food that Curry ate. So he would always be at our place eating, you know. And <laughs> they were going through life changes and couldn't keep him. So we're like, you know, we'll just take him in. But amazingly, like all my neighbors saw how he transformed, like once he moved in with us, like his coat became softer, itching kind of went away. And yeah. he, and they were the reason, like, you know, why I started like curry and pepper. They're like, what did you do to him? Because he was very popular in our community. Like everybody knew him and they're like, he's changed, you know? And, uh, and I, and I'm like, yeah, he's like on a plant-based diet, you know, and that kind of change and his behavior changed too. He used to be a lot more depressed before, you know, like, um, kind of sad and, you know, like, um, you could tell that he was not like the happy, happy dog that he could be. But uh, after transitioning over, uh, he transformed completely. Like even now at the age of 15, he still goes on hikes. But just before moving uh, from US uh, to uh, India, we like did one last hike up in the snows in the mountain with him. And he was totally good with it, you know. So he had like this amazing energy and he was a completely whole new dog. So I think what you put there, the science behind the way you explained, I think it's so important. So just talking about that, you know, like you mentioned, uh, uh, plant matter the plant fiber is food for our gut microbiome right and um, keeping the diverse variety of our gut microbiome alive is like so important for health so can you um, talk a little bit or explain uh, what would you tell somebody when they come back and say you know but I give tripe to my dog and that has plant matter in it you know so they're kind of getting their plant-based uh, material from there and uh, how, how does like that compared to fresh whole vegetables help dogs with cancer yes yeah, so um i mean tripe for example and the organ meats so uh, so many of the the well people say they're feeding the fresh raw meat-based foods to their dog and they feel they're giving a balanced diet they maybe go to these companies that offer the the organ meats plus they have vegetables plus and they they have the supplements in there and they say oh no I'm much happier with this diet and this is a more natural diet but when you consider the amount of toxin or the amount of and unnatural things that our feedlot animals in particular are being fed consider the chickens rammed into a chicken house that live for six six weeks and they have to grow as fast as they can so they're given growth hormone promoters they're given antibiotics sometimes if there's a problem in the water they, they'd have those um and and the feedlot cattle that are given anti-parasitic treatment these these are all and these are all toxins to an animal's body and they all have to be excreted so they all accumulate in the kidneys and the liver and and in the, in the intestines where they're going to to be getting rid of them really but mainly in, in these organ meats is where these toxins will accumulate these organs but but not only that because the chickens have to grow so fast some chickens are actually fed fish meal as well Oh. as a protein source and fish meal is extremely high in arsenic and lead and cadmium and mercury because fish is extremely high in those as soon as a fish 
reaches um, the oxygen, it starts to undergo bacterial putrefaction, which is why fish smells so bad, but it's actually full of bacteria. This is mealed up, this is fed to the chicken. So you've got this bioaccumulation of toxins that goes through, it'll go through into the organs of the chicken as well, into the liver and the kidneys. And then you've got people thinking, oh, this is wonderful, I'm feeding the organ meat which is so healthy because it's full of the phosphorus and full of iron and protein, but, but it's also full of these accumulated toxins that these poor feedlot animals are that are bred purely for meat, whether they're chickens or, or pigs or, or, or cows, are going to have. So, so that is an immediate signal that, that meat-based is not good for our dogs it really isn't because then what our dogs have to do with this is their kidneys their livers then have to really work hard to get rid of these toxins that are coming through whether it's the kibble whether it's the raw meat whether it's cooked meat it they then have to get rid of these toxins so um sorry you I haven't really answered your question well because I think the tripe that is fed um, now, they, they're not allowed to include, and I speak for the UK because the UK has actually very strict laws with, um, with regards what goes into, into pet food and what goes into human and the human chain. They're not allowed to put any of the intestines into pet food at all in the UK, but they are allowed to put tripe and they are allowed to sell tripe because people in the UK eat tripe. It's a bit disgusting, but they do. Um, and it is just the, the stomach content of the cow, but it does have to be washed before it's sold. So, um, and it, it will all come from, from one place. Oh, we've got your little... <laughs> <Young camera. laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> come to join in, <laughs> come to listen. <laughs> and um, and so, so the tripe actually will have no fibers in it, I don't think. I think once it's been washed and is rare, because a person will not want to sit and eat their tripe and have a whole lot of, of digested grass matter. So so no, that to answer your question, no gut bacteria um make it won't make your gut bacteria happy at all to receive tripe. That that's an excellent question answer because um, I get that a lot. And I also think like so this is based on the Ayurveda perspective, which is what I follow mostly. Um, when you eat like fresh whole foods, they're full of living energy, life energy or prana, what we call, and which is what the gut microbiome thrives on, basically. And um, if you were to feed like tripe, it's already dead matter by then. There's no life energy left in that plant matter that's in the intestines. Um, yeah, maybe it's more like uh, kind of pre-digested and stuff, but the living energy or the vital force is kind of lost in it, you know? So I think mm -hmm. the vital force is, uh, is one of those things that uh, animals and humans alike cannot, um, there's no way you can kind of uh, increase you can only conserve, you know. So when you feed and eat uh, living foods, you're actually conserving your vital force and which kind of builds your immunity and energy, you know. So uh, I think um, that's the, the prana or the living energy is also lacking in um, meat-based or um, animal products, you know. And that's the reason why Ayurveda actually classifies food into three categories, you know, like the sattvic, Rajasik and Tamsik, but uh, where it kind of food in the higher living food, and then uh, there's hardly any, you know, because that controls your mind, you know, the food that you put in. Oh, not, the, um, the mind basically kind of what you kind of mentioned about the dog being fearful, you know, like the uh, mm -hmm. the large dog, the schnauzer. So uh, I, I think so that kind of connects and coming and you kind of explaining it from uh, a veterinarian's perspective, I think that really helps um, people connect the dots, you know. So uh, thanks for explaining that. So uh, now connecting that to our next question, um, you mentioned that uh, meat-based food is high in fats, uh, especially. Uh, so how does that affect uh, the GI tract? You know, like there are so many dogs that I see who are on meat-based diet, like with really bad pancreatitis. Um, so can you explain a little bit about like how uh, plant-based diets can actually help uh, 
you know, uh, create a stronger gut and help uh, incidences of pancreatitis come down. Yep, absolutely. Or heal, actually. Yeah, I think um, there have never been so many cases seen of pancreatitis in dogs before as we're seeing in the UK at the moment because we've had such a rise in people believing that raw feeding is is better for a dog than kibble food. Um, there's been so much advertising around that. And so people feed their dogs this raw meat from when they're very little. And the, the levels of fat are so high, but it's not just normal fat. Animal fat is saturated fat, which means it's solid at room temperature. And this is the dangerous fat. And um, pancreatitis is an inflammation of the, the pancreas, which produces the enzyme that helps to digest the fat. But when you have anything itis, it means inflammation. And it is possibly one of the most painful conditions that you could put your dog through, because what you're getting is you're getting these enzymes released into the body around the pancreas, not just into the intestines to help to digest the food, but actually they start to digest the, uh, the, the regions in the, your dog's organs. So the inflammation, the pain is, is incredible. So we have what's called um, dogs walking on eggshells. They'll come in with their backs arched. You just touch their abdomen and they scream. And uh, they then have to have no food. They have to be hospitalized. This is so distressing for, for any pet parent to have their dog away from them for, for one night, two nights, three nights on a drip permanently. And, and knowing that their dog is in such severe pain, but the worst bit of all is that they've actually caused it by feeding the wrong foods. So plant-based diets, we don't have saturated animal fats, obviously, but we don't really have saturated fats. The only saturated fats you get with, with plant-based would be avocado or, or coconut. And we don't tend to formulate diets with avocado. The avocado is included in some pet foods and can be given to dogs as long as it's not the, the skin and the, the pip. But, um, but And coconut oil is a fantastic, as you said, mix for golden paste in combination with, um, with good gut fiber. We've got this what's called a cocoa mega effect, which is absolutely fantastic. It's a medium chain triglyceride coconut. And so, so this actually um, enhances the health of our pets, but it has to be given moderately. But the likelihood of a dog suffering from pancreatitis um, is going to reduce severely. And anytime you've got inflammation in the body, um, whether it's inflammation from obesity, whether it's inflammation from uh, pancreatitis or uh, colitis and inflammation of the intestine, or dermatitis, inflammation of the skin, you've got cells that are damaged. And as soon as you have cells that are damaged, it makes your dogs more likely to develop cancer, more likely to, to what's called mutate. These cells are more likely to mutate and result in cancer. So if we can reduce inflammation in our own bodies, in the bodies of our dogs, reduce the number of cells by reducing their weight, then we immediately reduce the the risks of getting cancer in our dog and dust. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I, that's another thing that I see a lot is like a uh, dog with pancreatitis and um, mm -hmm. I think plant flower yes. works very well for it as well. So our next question, and um, this one is very, very common and like even young dogs here in India, like I see dogs like two years old, uh, three years old with like hip dysplasia, arthritis, um, at an early onset, you know, like um, partly because it's poor nutrition or not the right nutrition. So um, can you explain how um, plants actually help uh, alleviate uh, conditions like arthritis? 
Yeah, absolutely. So nutrition from the word go, from when you're the from when puppies are very young is so important. And you've just said it is if you're not getting the right nutrition, even when you're born, even when you're in the womb of, of, a, of a dog, for example, if if a female dog has too much vitamin A, dogs can suffer with cleft palates. So it's actually caused by nutrient problems. Our little dog Ruff, who's a rescue, he's got a terribly deformed little front leg. Um, which he was born with. And dogs should not have deformities unless they're specifically bred as a breed. So his mum, she she would have been roaming the streets of Cyprus, I imagine. She probably had so many nutritional deficiencies. So this results in problems to start with. So um, actually, right from the word go, the nutrient requirement of our puppies is so important. They've got a much higher requirement of calcium, of phosphorus, of copper, of zinc when they're very young. And it's so important to get that right. But it's also so important not to give them too much protein so that they grow too fast. Because actually growth too quickly can result in severe arthritis problems and severe joint issues in some of our larger breed dogs. So it's so important to get that balance just right when they're puppies. Um, it's also important not to neuter them too early, very interestingly, because they've shown that um, the estrogen and the testosterone both protect the joints of our especially our large breed dogs later on because they actually result in better production of collagen and we all know that collagen is so important in the joints of of dogs and um, and when our dogs are puppies as well you need to do this when they're puppies as when they're older dogs, when you mentioned hip dysplasia, Hetel, is, um, is putting down non-slip mats. If you've got a very slippery floor and you've got a very bouncy puppy or a bouncy young dog that loves to jump and they keep slipping, maybe they fly around a corner and they slip. Every time they slip on those joints that are developing, they will develop problems later on in their life. So just put some non-slip mats down so that they don't slip because any slipping when they're younger is going to impact their joints later on in life. You do obviously get genetic problems and you've got certain breeds, the German Shepherds that have lines of hip dysplasia that carries on through into um, into certain family lines and they can suffer with, with hip dysplasia. But joint issues with dogs can be managed so well on a plant-based diet. You've already mentioned golden paste. We've got two of the best anti-inflammatories is turmeric and boswellia that can be used and in the combination with piperine from black pepper to result in really good absorption of the um of of these these herbs but um but as soon as your dog carries less weight has the natural natural nutrients from plants they'll have more energy and joints are meant to move. They're a bit like the machinery of a car. If they just sit still, they'll just rust and they'll go hard and solid. And the important thing is to keep dogs energetic, to keep them walking. And that's the best way to actually resolve or maintain a dog with arthritis as they get older is to keep them walking. Gentle walks, if it's if it's really bad. Um, the other thing you want to do to keep their weight down is to stop them jumping. When they jump, when they're small, they're overweight and they jump, they will suffer with ruptures of their cruciate ligament in their knees. Um, we get so many little dogs in the UK that jump on the sofa, they jump on the bed because they sleep on the bed, they're overfed, they get to about six or seven, they're carrying that extra weight and they rupture their little ligaments in their knees. And that will set them up for arthritis, terrible arthritis later on because we've immediately got damaged joints. So, so keeping your dog at a good, healthy weight, giving them the right nutrients that's going to actually be beneficial to their muscles, to their joints and to their ligaments is so important. The right levels of manganese and there's, there's one nutrient and I think it is manganese that is lacking in a raw food diet that's so important for the for the ligaments of a dog and um, and actually they get weaker 
ligaments if they're only fed a high meat-based diet, whereas a balanced plant-based diet. But so important to supplement a plant-based diet because you're not going to get the right level of nutrients just with plants. You've got to, every single dog food diet has to be supplemented. Even the most expensive cooked meat-based diet has to have supplements. Um, and certainly in plant-based, just like in human plant-based, you've got to add in those supplements that will provide everything for the joints. But, um, but I do feel that plant-based is possibly one of the best for dogs with joint issues. I really do. Yeah, I think it keeps them lighter and keeps them more yes. mobile. Uh, like yes. both my dogs are like still fully active and mobile. Like uh, I think it's great because they've been on the plant power, you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there was one point that you brought up, and I think it's very important for our audience to know. You mentioned supplementation. I know even meat-based food uh, that is home cooked or even commercial for that matter is supplemented as well. Um, so can you uh, shed light on why it's so important to um, supplement the food and um, how, like uh, why is basically why is it important to give them balanced nutrition and I know you have the just be kind uh, dog food supplement which uh, is something that you use in the UK to basically create complete meals so can you talk a little bit about that and why it is so important to supplement uh, a dog's food yeah, absolutely. So, so as I mentioned before, every food has to be supplemented, whether it's tinned food, dry food, it's everything falls under certain guidelines. In a, the Americans have their guidelines, in, in the EU and the UK, there are FEDIAF guidelines that have to be followed. And dogs have to have a certain level of vitamin D3. They have to have a certain level of, of calcium, of iron, of iodine, of vitamin K, of vitamin A, D, E, everything. And you cannot formulate any diets. The, 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 there is a, a company that was started in London where they make fresh meat-based um, diets for dogs. It's grown hugely in popularity. I think they've just bought out another huge company in Europe because they've become so popular. But they have to supplement those foods. They worried me so much because this company last year brought out a plant-based option. I was thrilled they brought out a plant-based option. But I went to have a look at the supplements that they'd added to their plant-based food. And it was identical to the supplements that was being added to their, their lamb or their beef or their chicken. And this worried me. I contacted the company, but obviously <laughs> it's too big and they're not interested and they're, yeah. they're not. But, um, but just like with us on a plant-based diet, we have higher requirements of certain nutrients. So we, we've got a much higher requirement for vitamin B, for example. We've got a higher requirement when I, I know for myself, when I get a certain age, I've got a higher requirement for calcium. But um, and, and our omega-3s as well, uh, we've got a, a higher requirement for those. And, and vitamin D3, we've got a higher requirement. So these are all things that we have to add into our own diet. But similarly, our dogs are even more important to get that balance right because dogs have a much higher requirement of calcium than us. They have a higher requirement of protein than us. Um, they certainly have that requirement of the vitamin D3 that you can't obtain through just the food. It must be supplemented. The vitamin Bs have to be supplemented. That extra calcium and the right calcium phosphorus combination has to be supplemented. And, um, and the most important one really is, and this has sort of come about in the last few years even, is the necessity of taurine in the diet of our dogs. Because when we put our dogs onto a high um, onto a plant-based diet to get it balanced, we have to use the legumes, whether it's the beans, the lentils, the peas, the soya. Legumes, unfortunately, are very low in the sulfur amino acids. And, um, and taurine is one of those, it's not quite an amino acid, it's a precursor to methionine that's an amino acid. But taurine is a huge requirement in dogs. Different breeds have a higher requirement of taurine. Golden retrievers, Newfoundlands, the giant breeds, dogs with heart conditions, uh, 
but whether it's just heart murmurs that your dog has, mitral valve problems, they have a much higher requirement of taurine. Dogs with hyperthyroidism, they have a much higher requirement of, of taurine. And, um, and this must be supplemented. And it's something that can't be over supplemented, really. It's not something that will affect any other organs if you give too much of, of this. So this has to be added to a dog's plant-based diet. Otherwise, as an owner, you just wouldn't forgive yourself if your dog came down with some condition and you knew that it was due to, and I've had that, I'm getting that, I'm sure you get that too, Hatel, yeah. is owners who contacted me and one lady who was who was feeding what looked like a wonderfully nutritious diet to her little Betsy, her little miniature poodle, but, um, but she wasn't adding the supplement. She was adding the lentils and the quinoa and everything, but she wasn't adding the supplement. And what her dog suffered from is such severe pain and her, the, the bones were just disappearing because there was no vitamin D3 and there wasn't enough calcium. Um, she sent me the x-rays. She had to carry the little dog around and the dog was in such pain. And as soon as it was on a balanced diet, Betsy's health has transformed. Um, and, and so many like that. Urinary tract problems as well is dogs that don't have enough of the amino acid methionine, which actually helps to acidify the urinary tract and prevent the formation of struvite crystals. So all good foods should have enough methionine as well added to them. So these are all things that we've only really learned properly in the last few years. I think it's really dangerous. Uh, you're kind of jeopardizing your dog's health. So I think uh, I, I strongly encourage everybody to use the right supplements. Um, for all of you who are in the UK, um, Dr. Ariel has an amazing uh, supplement called the Just Be Kind, and it comes along with recipes too. So that's an excellent product for you that you have access to. Unfortunately, it's not available here. Um, for those of you who are in the US, they have veggie dog there. And um, here in India, you can always use the Korean pepper uh, meal balancer which kind of helps you complete your dog's plant-based meal. So these are all specifically formulated for plant-based diets, you know. So uh, it kind of fills in those nutritional gaps. So it's not like just taking in any supplement and adding. There's a lot of thought that's been put into these supplements where you have to balance certain ratios and all of that is taken care into building these, you know. So I strongly encourage that you kind of research the supplements that you're adding in and make sure you're using the right brands, you know, because I think... Uh, just not being not using the right amount could be uh, equally dangerous as well. Mm, absolutely, it's yes. You you've got to got to add in the right amount. And there's there is another company in the US called Opal. Opal, and yeah. I'm really happy. in Australia also has because I have quite a few people who you're wanting to. In Australia, there is an, and I can't remember its name now. Shivega. No, no, that um ah. Oh. Shivega isn't available in, in in Australia, but no, it's got the picture of a little French bulldog on the front. Uh, anyway, but okay. there is, if anybody's listening from Australia, just let them contact me and I'll let you know which one it is. <laughs> so there are now options available. A few, several years ago, this was not really easily available, but now I think plant-based diets making at home has become so much more easier thanks to like a lot of the effort that's being put in like by Dr. Ariel, like Compassion Circle, uh, Melinda Fielder, and so many other people, you know. So um, I encourage you uh, to kind of check out uh, the Just Be uh, Kind uh, website. So tell me, uh, Dr. Ariel, how can people find, uh, find out more about you and the work that you do uh, on Plant Power for dogs? Uh, what's the best way for people to reach you? Yeah, so, um, well, I have a website, Just Be Kind website, and um, and I also, I obviously sell the foods that are all balanced, plus the supplements, um, and I'm here for people who who have queries. If you wanted a teleconsult, a one-on-one, -on -one, I, I love talking to the owners and meeting owners and helping them sort out the problems with their dogs, because they all are solvable, they really are. And um, and I also have a, a nutrition. Well, I've called it a masterclass now. It's it's actually being ramped up because I'm introducing four new recipes and and there's so many new um, sections that are going into this plant based. It used to be a course, but I've just called it a masterclass now because um, it was actually Diana Lavadio Dunets who made me realize 
she said to me, my goodness, she says, there's so much information in there. <laughs> You've got to call this a masterclass. I said, all right, I'll call it a masterclass. <laughs> so there's that as well. But, um, and that's that's under Dogs Go Plant Based website to find that. Um, but yes, otherwise, um, just make your dog plant based is all I can say. I just wish I'd done it years and years ago. I really do. Yeah, I, I thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's really important to be having access to you, you know, because there are not many veterinarians uh, who believe in plant-based nutrition. So sometimes it's a lot of challenge for like pet owners for feeding uh, plant-based nutrition. They're always looked up, looked down upon by their vets. So having being having this access and being able to kind of do a teleconsult with you, I think is really a great resource for everybody. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'd like to wrap up today's uh, session and open up our lines for Q&A. I think we've already run over, but uh, uh, I'd like to give a first preference to people who took uh, put in efforts for joining and by signing up. So maybe, uh, Shikhar, can we, do, are you okay with that, uh, Dr. Ariel? Like if we could just Yes, go... no problem. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> if we can go through the questions on Zoom first. Okay. Thank you so much. So there have been questions posed by Elizabeth and Elizabeth. So I believe these are the same people or two different people. I think there anyway. are two uh, Elizabeths, one from India and I think one from Greece. Great. So quite an engagement by both of them. Quite a few questions asked. So I'll start with the first one. Um, for those who are, uh, so I'll talk about Elizabeth from Greece, uh, the point she had made. My dogs eat vegan food since 2017 and they're doing great. Dr. Ariel helped me with her advice how to change the diet of my younger dog from kibble to homemade plant-based food because he had high SDMA and creatinine. After a year with this diet, his SDMA and creatinine went down to normal. I'm so grateful to Dr. Ariel. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. Uh, good. So not a question. Thank you so much, yes. Elizabeth. And I love yes. that. I think Caramello. I love the name of her dog. <laughs> <laughs> can these supplements uh like the curry and pepper meal balancer and veggie dog i don't think they're appropriate for like dogs with ckd can just be kind supplement be used with for dogs with ckd as well or um it can't no um so that's why i've got a whole section in my in my plant-based nutrition masterclass because you actually have to because of the high phosphorus level, um, that would be a bit too high for dogs with kidney conditions. So you actually have to add in all the elements differently. You have to add in the calcium separately and the taurine separately and the vitamin B separately. But it can be done, as, um, yeah, totally. as Elizabeth has mentioned and done so well with Caramello. Yeah. Uh, yes, she says she uses taurine, methionine and omegas. Um, which she's been able to to source individually that are so needed. So well done, Elizabeth, with all you're doing. Okay, now on to the question by Elizabeth from India. Uh, so she wants to pose these questions. For those who are, that's, there are two questions in the same comment. The first one is, for those who are unable to feed home-cooked meals with supplements, what is the second choice? Homemade without supplements or commercially prepared wet or dry plant-based food for dogs? That's the first one. Would you like me to uh, speak out the second question too in the same way? Um, oh, I'll answer that, that first one quickly for Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, definitely go with commercial food rather than an unsupplemented homemade diet because um, you will come across nutrient deficiencies that won't show straight away, but a few months years down the line they definitely will show and commercial foods that are plant-based and good quality ones that are made by a good reputable company your dog will be getting everything from that without the the nasties that you get in meat-based kibble as I mentioned about this bioaccumulation you've got none of that in um, in plant-based commercial foods all right so I'll come up with the second question. How will mainstream vets eventually get on board with plant-based diets? Also, how long will it take with and without backing from vet associations and universities, given the conflict of interest with the pet food industry? 
Yes, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's the, the conflict with the pet food industry. Um, so the, the problem in the UK is we've got corporatization where most 80% of the practices in the UK have been bought out by the large corporates. And one of these very large corporates is actually owned by Mars Pet Care, which owns all the, the pet foods in the UK, the very big ones. So obviously they have a pure financial interest in wanting to sell their products. So those practices are going to be extremely hard. I tried to, I, I went to, to one of the big group meetings in, um, in the UK, in London, um, and I spoke to one of the owners of one of these enormous corporates, um, and she didn't even want to know about plant-based feeding. I was so sad. Um, I tried. But um, so so my goal is, is to target veterinary students. So what I'm doing is going to veterinary colleges because I feel this is our future. These are the ones who are the most open-minded to it, who want the change. I see it in my own children and they they just want the change. But um Diana um Davenu Duretz and I are going to we we're going to work on a course together for vets, her in the US and me in the UK, to actually deliver a, a proper course. So so we will see changes and the British Veterinary Association just two weeks ago said that they were going to change their thoughts because of all the the latest evidence. Um, Professor Andrew Knight is continuing to bring out papers. He's just wonderful. He says he's bringing out another paper in June, this time about cats. So um, the, the positivity around it, there's been no other um, food, um, pet food group uh, that's caused, that's had so many published papers done. Um, and so things will change. I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm going about it very gently because I, I don't want to step on toes and make people really revel. So I, what I do is I've gone, I formed, a, it's called the Sustainable Pet Food Association which doesn't mention even the word, well, definitely not the word vegan, but even the word plant-based, just to make it sound more approachable for vets and more for vets. And that association contains all the big companies that we've got in the UK, all these wonderful independent pet food companies, even mentioning the big groups that are producing commercial plant-based. So the thinking will change. It's changing so fast in the human space that it has to change in, in the, the dog space. Yeah, I think it's definitely in the coming years, it's going to be uh, the way for feeding pets. Uh, because yeah. I think there's a lot of um, like pet parents are now at a point where, you know, they've done everything and mm, they've kind of given, right. are slowly giving up on meat-based diets and like you know as a last resort they're kind of finally like now opening up to being able to try um, plant-based food it was not like this 12 years ago when I had started this journey with my dogs and uh, started curry and pepper back in California I had literally called all the 100 AVMA nutritionists on uh, and you know everybody refused to work with me you know they just yeah. flat out refused and finally I was able to get like I convinced one and then that's how we developed the Korean pepper um, dog food brand and that's where the whole journey began you know but she was so afraid like I'm not quoting her name because she didn't want me to quote it because she was afraid like you know how people would respond or how other mm -hmm. nutritionists would mm -hmm. respond and it was not just so open back then but now I think the landscape is slowly changing. Yeah, absolutely. And and my advice I always give is never mention the word vegan when you mention what you're feeding your dog. Just go with plant-based. Plant it's so much more neutral and approachable. And it sounds, because we see so many products in our supermarkets, whenever we go shopping, we see plant-based, this plant-based, that plant. -based. So that's becoming a common term in our minds. And I think as soon as vets hear the word vegan, that just sounds like, too much is being taken away, but plant-based sounds so much more neutral. So that would be your starting point with your vet. And yeah. I'm always mentioning to them that that you've approached Hatel, you've had a, a nutritionally formulated plan for your dog. Um, and as soon as you, you mention that, that takes the stress away from your vet because you've done your research and you've actually shown that that you've taken your dog's nutrition seriously they don't know about it but then 
they can leave it up to you and that that'll give them peace of mind to support you as well and it's the same here in india too like most vets are not trained vets are not trained in nutrition here in india too and now you know players mm-hmm. like mars are kind of taking over uh, it's so it's kind of uh, sadly the same story but Liz, uh, so there is some work that i have been doing in kind of bringing awareness among vets here so i'll actually be meeting a few vets uh, when i travel to mumbai in a couple of days uh, for mm-hmm. this reason to kind of encourage them on plant based healing and plant based um, uh, diets as well so hopefully well, in some time maybe it'll be a lot more accepting over here as well well done Hazel. you do your your bit your end i'll do my bit my end we'll get people changing their thoughts yeah and part of these webinars is also to kind of bring that awareness in there right yeah, absolutely so, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, sorry yeah go shall ahead. i yes okay so elizabeth has an array of comments for well, the first one is that she has shared her blog post about how she has talked about that uh, non plant based or animal based uh, pet food is environmental uh, is environmentally and health wise harmful and on the other hand vegan food is uh, helpful so if you want you can check it out and she has then uh, talked about how golden paste has helped her dog with arthritis now the question she has is regarding l carnitin uh diana who wrote the plant powered dog said in an interview how important it is to give them l carnitin but dr ariel told her not to worry about it so last year when she was talking about her dog's homemade food now she is wondering whether she should add it in her dog's food or not yes i would elizabeth absolutely the all the the um training of of l carnitine definitely supports it the only thing i will say about l carnitine um and is that it's it's used in bodybuilders and apparently bodybuilders who take too much of the supplement l carnitine end up with very fishy smelling um <laughs> sweat <laughs> and actually i've found that dogs that are supplemented with maybe a little bit too much alkanity they actually do have quite smelly fishy breaths interestingly so that would be the only side effect but it certainly is one of the amino acids that is shown to to help so if you can get hold of it in greece then absolutely i would add it to caramello's diet as well as well as the taurine and the methionine yeah <clears throat> okay thank you so uh, elizabeth had also said that d3 is never vegan d2 is vegan d3 is vegan uh, d3 you get vegan so i uh, uh, what we use your in uh, korean pepper meal balancer it is a vegan source and it's derived from mushrooms and lichens um, it is a little bit more expensive but uh, yes you do get it yeah absolutely i'll, I'll let you speak as well dr ariel yeah so so the that that's been the biggest um, source of of stress for so many of the independent plant based companies in the uk is sourcing a proper plant based d3 in their in their dry food or their tinned food i know joe's here from hound and she spent two years trying to to get hold of it but it comes from lichen or it comes from algae um i sell the um omega 3 algae oil which um which is just fantastic i just love this product and that has the vitamin d3 the pure vitamin d3 which is so good for dogs joints we haven't even spoken about that but that's another element that is incredibly good for dogs joints but equally what you're doing is you're just protecting our oceans because it's where fish are very high in omega 3s because they eat the marine algae so instead of eating the fish which is full of the heavy metals you just go straight to the source and um and use the the marine algae the omega 3 algae oil but that also has the the vitamin d3 which um which is pure all of it pure no no heavy metals in there at all and very effective so um just to help clarify for everybody uh, so basically um, the just be kind supplement um is used in conjunction with the algae oil to include the d3 okay. in there as well as the omega's right 
Correct. Just to make sure that the dog has the right level of, of omegas and yes, and the right level of, of D3 in the most natural form. And the recipes will be the recipes that are formulated, follow all the, the FEDIAF requirements so that the dogs have just the right level of absolutely everything. Um, all done with German precision. I've got German vet nutritionists that do it. So then, you know, it's really done. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yes, uh, Darshita had asked a question. Um, where can we connect to understand, understand better about plant-based diet for diabetic dogs? Um, well, feeding a, a dog a, a balanced plant-based diet is actually one of the best for a diabetic dog because you've got sugars that you don't get any of the sugar spikes because you've got a high fiber diet um, and you obviously don't end up with anything damaging that's going to harm the, the pancreas in any way you're just giving the best nutrients that you can um, so it's it's possibly just following a balanced whole food plant-based diet will definitely benefit a diabetic dog. Um, even, even a kibble diet will actually be beneficial to a diabetic dog. Yeah, and I think also measuring, if especially if you're doing like homemade, uh, using proper supplements and measuring out the ingredients is really important for a diabetic dog. Um, yeah. Just recently, I worked with a diabetic dog where um, he was, they were taking him for euthanasia because he had been oh. 14 years old and he was on high doses of insulin. So vet, the vet asked that the, said that there's not much we can do. Can we put him down? And that's when one of uh, somebody reached out saying that it's an emergency. Can you do anything from take him, taking him out of euthanasia? You know, And I just told them, like, what is he eating right now? And they're like, he's on a meat-based diet. And then, you know, I just told him, give him a few months. Let's see, you know, don't rush on it. We've transitioned him fully into a plant-based diet. His sugar levels have started dropping down. Now we're kind of doing uh, flower remedies to actually start taking him. Like we're beginning to reduce his insulin levels now um, through the flower remedies. And this was a dog that was actually going to die. And just yesterday she called me and said, you know, he is so much better. And like, I want to change, do this for all my dogs now, you know? Oh, well so, done. Oh, it's so lovely to hear. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so like sometimes you'll hear things from people where they say like plant-based diet, the carbs and everything is not good for di diabetic dogs. It's not true. My brother is diabetic and he turned vegan and he's off insulin, off medications, 30 years of diabetes reversed in six months through plant power. So mm -hmm. for, hu for humans and for our animals, I think it's the best mm -hmm. thing. I think you 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 mentioned the the carbohydrates. People always just associate a plant based diet with carbohydrates, and it's not. We've got just this purest form of all the plant powered proteins. And yes, dogs need fifty percent of their diet to be carbohydrates. But if you give the whole grains as the carbohydrate source, that's just the the ideal diet, really, which will sort out any conditions, <laughs> not just diabetes, yeah. <laughs> any inflammatory conditions. So yeah, I think we're kind of quite a bit over time, but I think this uh, webinar was so informative and I think I'm sure our audience has uh, gained a wealth of knowledge through um, this webinar. And if they are not already on a plant-based diet, I hope it'll inspire them to make the switch. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Ariel. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you can, taking the time to kind of speak with us and share your expertise. You know, I'm so grateful to you. Oh, an absolute pleasure. And thank you too with all you're doing. I think you're wonderful. And good luck with going to Mumbai and convincing those best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, everyone. So the recording yeah. will be made available. Uh, I'll share it right after the tech stuff is done. Uh, so you guys should receive that as well. So thank you, everyone, online, on IG and Facebook as well for joining in.